thank you. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for including this paper in the program. So, uh, this, uh, this is a paper I co-wrote with Luciano and Tamaro. We are, the three of us are all at the Swiss Finance Institute and uh, at University of Lausanne and University of Geneva. So, before starting, just to make clear, here we are talking about central bank digital currency in the sense that they are retail CBDC and there are going to be a direct liability of the central bank. So um, we saw today a lot of uh, literature review. This one you can see is not exhaustive, uh, exhaustive. it's also a bit old. Uh, but just to point out that what we are doing here, we are trying to cover um, the interaction of central bank digital currency with monetary policy and we uh, take a particular focus on unconventional monetary policy. So what do we mean in uh, we have a theoretical model and in our model we distinguish between two monetary policy. Uh, what we call standard policy uh, try, tries to model what we had before the 2008 financial crisis and then we have quantitative, what we call quantitative easing and especially today for the presentation I'm going to focus on quantitative easing. So um, when the central bank implements quantitative easing, in theory, uh, it purchases, um, sorry, it, it creates um, reserves in order to purchase um, longer term security, uh, securities or distress assets in the attempt of stimulating the economy. And one result of these um, uh, asset purchase programs is Low, uh, low interest rates. Another result that we uh, notice is that uh, we have these newly created reserves that are sitting on the balance sheet. So uh, what we observe is if we look at the, at, at the Fed's balance sheet size, we see that as a result, uh, as a result of quantitative easing policy, the Fed's went from at least uh, a bit less than $1 trillion to almost $9 trillion the, the figure was at the end of last year. Now he's trying to tighten a bit, but uh, still we have huge um, uh, balance sheet. We have huge balance sheet. So um, as I was telling before, a central bank digital currency will be a new type of liability for the central bank. So we are trying to understand what's going to happen to the balance sheet of central banks if we are going to add another liability on top of those. And for sure, uh, CBC will permanently alter this uh, these, uh, central bank's balance sheet, and we want to understand what are going to be the consequences for the rest of the economy. So what's going to happen if we introduce a central bank digital currency while we're conducting quantitative easing? So what's going to happen on the access side, on the monetary policy, and for example, on banks lending? So here uh, it's uh, a summary of our results, and I will focus on the second, uh, on the last two. But uh, the first result that we find is that the equilibrium outcome, outcomes indeed differ if we consider introducing a CBDC under standard policy or under quantitative easing. So these first results kind of validate our question, and it tells us that if we want to um, model and understand um, uh, what are the, con the consequences for monetary policy, we need to do it in the right regime, under the right scenario. So now, uh, if we take a closer look just to quantitative easing, what we find is that uh, we can have different outcomes, different economic uh, allocation, uh, depending on the demand for CBDC. So here we don't speculate on a number, we're just uh, saying that if uh, the CBDC demand is going to be low or is going to be kept low um, by design, that uh, it is possible in this uh, scenario to introduce a CBDC that will be neutral for the economy. Neutral for, for the economy here means, in, in our paper, means that uh, it will not uh, affect lending and taxes. And finally, what we find is that um, on the other side, if uh, the CBDC demand is not kept low and the CBDC demand is too high, then we might have a problematic consequences for the economy in terms of uh, banks lending and tapering, and I'm going to dig a bit deeper on this. So 
how do we find these results? We take, uh, yes. So it seems like a very uh, discouraging conclusion, or like, I mean, uh, it can at best be neutral, is that what I can conclude? Uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't want to, uh, but at the end, yeah. So what we're here, we have some policy implication that say, okay, if we don't uh, pay attention to certain things, then we can have disruptive consequences for for the banking sector. So we must think about. Uh, um, in this paper, the best you can have is neutral. Uh, I have another paper that looks at, so it's not um, a general equilibrium, it's a partial equilibrium, so it looks at what happens in, the, in between. And uh, if we, for example, in, in introduce the possibility for uh, um, the central bank to refund a commercial bank, in that case, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so we're not saying don't do it. We're just saying uh, pay attention. Uh, <laughs> it's just, uh, okay. So what we do is we take this uh, banking model that was uh, presented in McGill, Kinsey and Roche paper. Uh, so it's a framework with general equilibrium in two periods. And what's interesting here is that we have a private sector with household cash pool and investor that maximize their consumption. Uh, and we have um, a representative commercial bank that is important in this model because it's the only one that can perform risk and maturity transformation. So it's the only one here that can uh, borrow uh, short safe deposits and land long risky loans. So it's the, the only one that can do that. And then we have a public sector and we have a fiscal authority and a central bank that are uh, merged in a unique entity that we call government. So in this scenario, what we do is we introduce a CBDC and we look at how the equilibrium allocation changes. So, and we compare uh, the new equilibrium allocation with, with the old ones and we see what happens. So, yeah. So, so fewer deposits to the commercial bank? No, okay. So, yeah, so. So, so something. So, okay. what, I mean, the what boxes all stay the same. Is, yeah, and, the, CBDC, uh, the CBDC is, go is, is going to be a new, um, so, a new mean of payments and saving technology only for households. Okay. And it's going to be directly on the central bank's balance sheet as a liability. Okay. So, okay. therefore, on the government balance sheet. And now I'm going to tell you a bit more on the assumption we may uh, we make on the CBDC. Uh, quick question about this one: Are you so? I understand that you made the, the assumption here that the CBDC is going to be uh, directly put into uh, the hands of the house, households by the government or the central bank, and disintermediate totally the commercial banks. Do you have another model where the commercial banks are the ones putting this uh, CBDC in circulation? Okay, let me come back to you in a, in a bit. Okay, so these are the assumptions we make on the CBDC. So the first thing is CBDC is interest bearing. Uh, we can relax this assumption, uh, but it's just easier to set the interest rate to zero and have it in the model. Um, it, what's important here, and I think uh, um, uh, brought as a similar thing in his model is that we have a convenience yield. So households will get an utility uh, to use this new payment technology or saving technology. And an important assumption, another important assumption we made is that uh, CBDC deposits and bank deposits are not perfect substitutes. So they are substitute until a certain point, but uh, they, uh, we won't have a corner solution. So it's not that one of the two will disappear, but we, uh, household 
at equilibrium, they will hold both. So we think this is a reasonable assumption because if, for example, you uh, think about the fintech we have today, PayPal, for example, uh, the average PayPal user also, have, um, also has a bank account. And we think with the CBDC, it will work in a similar way. So there are not going to be a perfect substitute. The important CBDC will be backed by assets. So if we... Uh, introduce in the economy new liabilities. If we increase the size of the central banks on the liability side, we must do so also on the asset side. And finally, here we, uh, I think it, it, it relates to your question, we um, um, assume a one-tier distribution. So uh, CBDC are a direct liability of central bank and they're distributed by the central bank. But this is, can it's just for sim simplicity in the representation. If we assume a two-tier distribution where the commercial bank intermediates the distribution of the CBDC, nothing is going to change in the model. It's just more difficult to represent. But uh, equilib uh, at equilibrium, everything will remain the same. And finally, we don't make any assumption on the design of CBDC in terms of token base, asset base, uh, online, offline. Um, Okay, so this is our CBDC. So what, uh, on the fourth bullet, please, backed by assets. So, so how is this different from what uh, from cash? Why is this? Uh, 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 why should cash, this be different from cash? It just means that we cannot do helicopter money. We with cannot CBDC. do what? We we cannot do helicopter money with CBDC. So if we issue a CBDC, then we must. Uh, backed it by uh, assets that can be risky securities if we are under quantitative easing, if we want to continue with qu quantitative easing, or they can ha be treasuries, for example. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm gonna, sorry, I'm going a bit deeper into the model. I'm going as quickly as possible, unless you, uh, you have questions. So here, what happens to the households, they, as I said, the, mo the model is in two periods, so households need to consume in both periods, so they have the possibility to exercise the saving option in order to consume in, period, in the second period. And here, they have two possibilities. They can put their savings either in bank deposits or in CBDC deposits, and uh, for each of the um, uh, options, they uh, are going to get an interest and a convenience yield. So here, for simplicity, the uh, utility we assume uh, an infinite uh, risk aversion utility, uh, and uh, the last formula here is how we ensure that we don't have corner solutions. So if um, the combination of convenience yield and interest rate is equal uh, for um, bank deposits is equal to the one for CBDC deposits, then at equilibrium we are going to have both. And of course, the CBDC might pay uh, a lower interest rate, but have a bigger uh, uh, convenience yield uh, for, uh, for households. And uh, so that's how it's going to say in the economy. Uh, cash pool uh, are also needs uh, to consume. So uh, what they do is they invest in uh, short, short term debt, basically. So they have possibility to invest in treasury and uh, for example, if there are not enough, enough treasury in, uh, in the economy, there is a, a short of, of safe assets, they can uh, resolve to bank debt. Uh, and they all, they're also infinitely risk averse and they maximize uh, their consumption. Funny. Investors are the last agents of our model and again, maximize their utility. And, they are the risk neutral um, players in our model. So they are the one that can invest in risky securities. Here in the model, we make strong assumption that risky security means bank equity. Because the commercial bank, uh, the, the underlying assumption is that the commercial bank is the only one able to screen good projects. So it's the only one uh, that can uh, um, directly invest in loans. And finally, they play the role, uh, they are going to pay taxes to the, to the government um, that we are gonna see uh, in a couple of slides. Okay, I have two last players. 
here we have a representative commercial bank that should be a representation of the entire bank banking sector. And of course, it gets all uh, uh, these, um, its liabilities from the agents we saw before. So on the liability side, we have deposits, wholesale that comes from cash pools, equity, um, and is going to take these funds and re uh, reinvest them uh, in the economy in, the, um, in, in terms of loans. Okay. And then we also have bank reserve because we uh, assume that there are gonna have, uh, there's going to be a liquidity requirement. Um, it's also subject to capital requirements, so it means that he has to fund part of its loan by uh, um, equity. Uh, and the liquidity and capital requirements are set by the central bank. Uh, yeah. And of course, the balance sheet constraint must, uh, must hold the equilibrium. Uh, okay. So the commercial bank is a, a big maximizer of our utility. So it takes the interest rate as given, and it maximizes on the quantity on its balance sheet, and it maximizes the expected profit. So the expected profit, uh, here is uh, a lot of equation, but basically it's given by uh, the revenues of its asset minus what he has to pay on the liability side. So bondholders and shareholders. Um, and it does so for every um, random payoff on loans so that uh, it's profitable, it's a solvent. Okay, and of course, uh, the balance sheet constraint must hold and they're subject to liquidity and capital constraint. Now, last year of the economy, so uh, I know it's a lot, uh, up, uh, first size, it's a lot of equation, but in reality, it's a very simple model. Um, so as I said before, we have a, bank and uh, a central bank and a fiscal authority and um, so on, on the liability side, we have that uh, government issue, both uh, CBDC, bonds, and, uh, and reserves. And uh, on the asset side, uh, we have taxes and uh, the, the other assets depend on the monetary policy. And of, uh, here, uh, we connect to the question that we had before on bank runs, we uh, assume an explicit an explicit insurance on bank deposits and an implicit one on wholesale funds so that we avoid uh, bank runs in our model. Uh, we just want to avoid them because it's not the focus on the paper. We can relax the hypothesis and change the research question. Um, okay. So here is how we model the monetary policy. Uh, so if uh, the central bank is conducting quantitative easing, then is, uh, it, on the asset side, it will have risky security. That in the model, again, strong assumption is the equity of the bank. And then it sets a low interest rate. And um, as I, uh, I was showing you before with the Fed's balance sheet, uh, we have excess reserves. So the liquidity uh, constraint here is not binding. And this will play a role in our results. Uh, and finally, a fiscal authority, it collects taxes and we define taxes as um, everything we need to repay uh, to the bondholders minus the uh, senior age on the assets. And in case of bankruptcy, the, uh, the taxes will cover the, uh, the costs. Okay, so this is more or less the setting of the model. What we do is um, we derive the equilibrium and since I don't have that much time, I'm going to jump to the result and I'm not going to bother you again uh, with formula. So I'm going <laughs> to skip this. But here's the economic intuition of what's happened at equilibrium. So let's say that um, you want to withdraw cash. So you go to the ATM and you ask your private bank to give you banknotes. But banknotes are a liability of the central bank. So behind closed door, what happens is that the commercial bank needs to go to the central bank and buy. Yeah, yeah, this is a central bank and a commercial bank. 
So uh, the commercial bank needs to go to the central bank and buy uh, banknotes uh, in order to give them uh, to you. And what, what, what would happen with CBDC is that households will want to transfer parts of their savings from bank deposits to CBDC deposits. And what's going to happen behind is going to be exactly the same. So CBDC are liability of the central bank. So the commercial bank will have to purchase CBDC for you in order to uh, transfer them to you. So when the commercial bank is going to the central bank and say, okay, now I need to give $100 of CBDC to, to, to my customer, what's gonna happen? The commercial bank, in order to balance, to balance the transfer, it will have to transfer uh, part of its resources in favor of the central bank. At this point, the, uh, the commercial bank it has two options in order to do this. Cash doesn't have to be backed by assets, but CBDC has to be backed Cash by assets. Cash has to be backed by assets. Okay. okay. Otherwise, it's helicopter money. Otherwise, it's not possible. Uh, you're just giving money to people. Yeah. Uh, free. For free. It's just, it's currently is not a, a, an option. We can, we can discuss about, uh, about the possibility to do it, but there's yeah. nothing to do with this. But Martina, in this, in this, just so that I understand, so the banks cannot subscribe directly, right? Only the households can, correct? I'm sorry. The households can invest in CBDC, but not the banks in this model. No. But, but the banks indirectly get involved because they become a throughput medium. Because, because households want to transfer their savings from commercial banks to central correct. bank. Okay. No, if the households are the only ones, it, it makes a lot of sense. Because if the banks got involved to subscribe, then they are already a treasury bill market, right? On which the yield works in a certain way. But if banks can also invest in this, then the yield on that may change. It's yeah. the only so point I want to make. What I just want to make sure is that here we're talking about retail CBDC. Yeah. Retail CBDC is only for retailers, only for households, general public, no financial institutions. Okay. So... As I was saying, we need uh, the, um, we, the, the commercial bank needs to transfer a uh, part of their resources to the central bank in order to settle the transaction. And it has two options. The first one it is uh, it liquidates part of its assets. The other is if we have a lot of reserves sitting on the balance sheet, they are poorly remunerated, then what we can also do is we're going to swap these reserves into CBDC deposits. So in this case, what's happening on the central bank's balance sheet is that we're swapping one type of liability into another. So it means that if we go through this option, the size of the central bank will not change. We're just going to have a switch on type of liability, and that's it. What we find in our model is that for the commercial bank, the cost of swapping is lower than the cost of liquidating. So if the commercial bank can decide what to do, it will prefer to swap excess reserves for CBDC deposits instead of liquidating assets. Commercial banks, sorry, why should commercial banks liquidate assets? So they, what, ha they have the assets already reduced because they hold fewer reserves. So if they, what we find is indeed that if they have reserves, they won't liquidate assets because, uh, I mean, uh, it's kind of a uh, logical Just get one. rid of an yeah. unproductive The, the only asset. thing is that if we arrive at one point where we don't have excess uh, uh, the liquidity res um, the liquidity requirement is binding. So we don't have... Um, we don't have um, excess reserves on the balance sheet, or let's say uh, the commercial bank wants a liquidity buffer, that at that point, the only thing uh, that it can do is to liquidate assets. It doesn't no, have a choice. No. no, they can borrow from the central bank. They can, can borrow from the central bank. They can collect deposits with the central bank instead of collecting deposits with the public. But then, so what you're saying is that What's going to be? It's going to be commercial bank deposits or CBDC. Because if they're CBDC, they're on the central bank has, uh, balance sheet. So it, they cannot be fund, funds for the commercial bank. 
there are only two situations that are possible. Either the liquidity surplus or there is a liquidity deficit situation in which the, the, it's exactly balanced when it happens. Never, never happens, or nearly. But uh, in case there are excess reserves, liquidity surplus, level of reserves diminishes, the uh, central bank balance sheet shrinks, and the uh, no, it, it remain, Sorry, it, it remains. It remains the same. Uh, they just swap uh, reserves for CBDC, and the, the, the balance sheet of the banking system uh, shrinks. In case there is a liquidity deficit, then the uh, central bank is going to increase its refinancing to the banks. So yeah, but then and in that case, so there is a the, the balance sheet of the commercial banking sector is going to remain of the same size. So we just collect deposits, just collect deposits from central banks, so we refinance with the central bank instead of collecting deposits with the public. So what just a substitution of yeah. liabilities in my mind what you're saying is that we are allowing commercial bank to borrow from central bank uh, so we central are, bank has we no choice it has to provide a, a, a channel between between central bank and commercial bank and that is uh, a working hypothesis at the moment i know but it opens a lot of other, uh, uh, other questions that we don't want to answer in this paper, but we have another paper that looks exactly into that mechanism. I, I just want to second Martina's perspective. Yeah. <laughs> and we need the rest of yeah. the question at the end. Okay. So um, we said that uh, co the, um, the commercial bank will prefer to swap excess reserves into CBDC. So a natural question is how many reserves can we, sw we swap as of today? Um, so in our model, uh, the treasure is given by um, the CBDC demand so that uh, the liquidity requirements is binding again. And in terms of, of real number, we try to, to get an estimate like back of, an, of the envelope with calculation, but we uh, say that in the US, for example, there are more or less 7 trillion of, uh, of deposits and four trillion of excess reserves. So this means more or less that um, the CBC demand must be, uh, so we are saying that households must uh, want to convert at least 25% um, of their bank deposits into CBDC. So if uh, the CBDC demand is lower, then we can have this swap. Otherwise, I mean, we don't have excess reserves. Uh, to swap anymore, so uh, the uh, central bank, uh, the commercial bank, is forced to liquidate assets or to take or, or to take loans from the central bank. So we we identify two different scenario scenarios. The first one um, is with a low CBDC demand, and this is just uh, quickly what's happened. So we want to transfer one unit from deposits to CBDC. So the reduction in deposits is completely compensated by a reduction in, uh, in reserves and nothing change on the lending. So since nothing change on the lending, this opens the possibility to have uh, a CBDC that is neutral to, to, to the economy. So how we're gonna obtain uh, no changes in the taxes, what's gonna happen on the central bank is that we are swapping type of liabilities. So we're gonna have complete neutrality, at least in the model, it's not policy recommendation, at least in the model, once uh, if the two liabilities have the same uh, cost for uh, the central bank. On the other side, I, um, if the uh, CBDC demand is too high, then of course the commercial bank will swap excess reserves into CBDC deposits as much as it can, but at one point, it will be forced to liquidate assets. If it's a force to liquidate assets, it means that lending is decreasing. If lending is decreasing, it means that there's no possibility of uh, neutrality. So at this point here, our paper uh, stops, but of course we can, uh, since we have a negative, um, a negative impact on lending, we can explore the possibility for funds. And we do that in another paper. One last argument that I would like to make is what's going to happen if we want to topper? 
So in theory, if the central bank wants to tighten its balance sheet, in theory, what should happen is a central bank sells assets back to the financial sector, and it does so in exchange for reserves. But now, if we have introduced the CBDC, and these reserves are, uh, have been swapped into CBDC deposits, it means that all these liability as are kind of decentralized and held by households. And we know from the literature that these households are very inelastic. So it means that if we want to taper at this point, the central bank will have to convince millions of inelastic retailers to give up their savings in exchange for assets, that they were distressed assets in the first place. So what we're saying here is attention, because if we introduce a CBDC under quantitative easing, then this might render this policy quasi-permanent, or at least very hard to roll back. So uh, maybe it's better to think before about tapering than introducing the CBDC. I don't know, but just uh, policymakers think about this point. Um, and I'm going to conclude here, so thank you. So, Martina, this is really good. <laughs> it, it's nice, right? I mean, we all like this. One question I have for you is, when the households go CBDC, the banks then don't have access to that liquidity pool, right? So the weighted average cost of capital for the bank now goes up. Why? Low-cost deposits are gone to CBDC. I'm not able to go into the stock market, which would have pushed my share price up, so if I do some refinancing. So I get hit from the debt side, and I get hit from the equity side. My weighted average capital of cost of capital went up, and therefore I'll pass that to the people that are borrowing from me. So we create that cyclical thing. But, but that's okay. I think so long as we plan for it. Uh, but it's maybe the model needs to tweak for that a little bit. At what is the indifference point at which that move has to happen, then we can plan a little better, maybe, right? Is that fair? Uh, on a different subject, I'm sorry, but related to your presentation. Uh, it's, it, I start with a point of vocab vocabulary. Uh, I suppose by tapering, you mean, uh, you don't mean unwinding. Uh, tapering, myself, I refer to as the slowdown is a net purchases of the central bank. Uh, what I thought you were referring to was rather unwinding, that is diminishing the total amount of assets held by the central bank, which are two different things. Okay. Hmm? okay. Yeah, I, I was referring to that. To unwinding. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in that regard, I'm not sure that even in the case where the uh, uptake of CBDC is low, uh, it's neutral. I think there can be a difference in the sense that uh, if the uptake is slow, is, is, is low, uh, if the central banks, then the central bank can keep the same amount of assets on its balance sheet, then it means that the asset is has purchases, which are, do not have to be, uh, by the way, risky assets, it can be treasuries, uh, this won't have to be paid back because you could see the same thing for CBDC as you've seen for banknotes. The amount can fluctuate in the short run, but in the longer run, the amount always increases. So this means that these assets that have been purchased won't have to be redeemed, but they will be renewed indefinitely. It's, it, in fact, it's uh, it's a uh, uh, perpetuity, you call that annuity? I mean, a perpetual bond, okay? Yeah. Uh, it, it makes a difference for the government uh, because it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a debt that won't have to be paid back. So it makes a difference in, it transfers uh, taxes into senior age, actually. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it does make yeah, a difference. Exactly. It's not exactly <laughs> neutral. No, no. Uh, uh, so um, the issue, the argument on, uh, on uh, what I call tapering uh, 
was regarding of uh, the CBDC demand. Um, yes, okay. um, you, you say that CBDC, with CBDC, there is a risk that uh, quantitative easing uh, become quasi permanent, but isn't already the case? <laughs> I mean, do we know some countries that have stopped doing quantitative easing after yeah, doing I mean, it on, on exactly, the own vaccine? Exactly. In these days, uh, with inflation rising uh, through new uh, highs, uh, we might want to think about the possibility of uh, tapering or reducing, uh, tightening. Uh, the central uh, the central bank's balance sheet because uh, I mean it's uh, it's true it's what we're what the Fed is trying to do right now. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, do we know how to like stop doing quantitative, quantitative easing after? Doing? In theory, yeah, we know how to do it. In practice, can we do it without the economy collapsing? Uh, I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm not the best expert on that. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, I'll ask a question. Yes, they did. They did reduce its balance sheet. They just uh, the, uh, zero profit. It did reduce its balance sheet quite drastically by just not rolling over the, uh, maturing assets. That's how balance sheets reduce. They don't sell them. They just let the maturing bonds mature. And so they don't hold them on their balance sheet. And so there's a counterpart change in the reserves. So, you know, yes, the balance sheets did go down. Uh, more than a tiny bit. They, I mean, they ended up having a problem that there was a, they reached the point at which liquidity started to become a problem. No, not now, but this was three years ago. Yes. Yeah, so just to get a bigger picture right. So like you consider the central bank has like some not a clear objective, like just doing some monetary policy, which happens to be unconventional. And then you introduce CBDC. Was this the paper? Mm -hmm. I see. And then so you yeah, we, we take we take the money. Uh, so in this oh. paper, we take the monetary policy as given. exogenous. It's given. So we consider two different monetary policy scenario and we introduce a CBDC in both of them. And we're not saying so. We're not saying we uh, change the monetary the policy in between. The situation without CBDC. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, thanks for all the interesting question, and uh, thanks, Martina. Thank you for a nice discussion. <laughs>